This time I'll be talking about multitask, multi-domain, and multilingual learning. This is a continuation of what we talked about last time with pre-training. And these are all important topics. And not all of them will be important for everybody in the class, but I think that there will be something in here that's important for everyone. So in other words, you know, this is meant to be a little bit broader uh, and less deep with the intention that I will be talking about something that is uh, important to you somewhere in this class. So hopefully uh, you, uh, it will be informative in that way. So multitask learning, we already talked about this before. Uh, basically, we train a model or representations from a model to uh, do well on multiple tasks at once. So we uh, have an example of this is an example going into an encoder where we train representations to be good at like language modeling or tagging, for example. And this is also something that I talked about last time uh, where we talked about performing multitasking when one of your two tasks um, has fewer data is a normal application scenario for multitask learning. And in this particular case, uh, last time we talked mainly about, for example, doing things from plain text to labeled text. So we would have a language model with a mass language modeling objective or a regular language modeling objective. And then we would apply that to some other downstream task where we didn't have as much data like parsing. However, there's other examples, and we're going to be talking a bit more about these examples in this class here. So, for example, general domain uh, training to specific domain training. So maybe we have web text or news text where we have labeled data, but then in this specific domain like medical text, we don't have labeled data, or even that might be the case for uh, language modeling data. So we might have domains where there isn't a whole lot of language modeling data available online. Uh, in general places, like let's say, um, just to give an example that I worked with before, there was a, a tire manufacturer that wanted us to uh, translate their tire manufacturing manuals for them. And they're just, they had these manuals on their own private servers, but they didn't have anything like that easily available online. So. Another example is high resource language to low resource language. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about multilingual learning. I'm only gonna be talking about multilingual learning briefly today uh, for two reasons. One reason is that um, to understand the interesting problems in multilingual learning, you need to know about things like syntax or semantics or morphology, which we're going to be talking about in later classes. Another reason is because we have a whole class on multilingual learning, 11, 7, 31. So um, if you're particularly interested in that, you can take that class in the spring. So uh, we're, uh, that's why it's going to be a little bit briefer this time. Cool. So with respect to multitask learning, I'm going to talk about a few uh, important pieces of methodology that you can use for it this time, uh, specifically uh, how to do selective parameter sharing and also how do we sample or weight uh, different tasks or different domains or different languages that we want to be working on. And these are all tools that can be uh, useful uh, for you as well. So uh, I, this is high level, are, are there any questions or can I go on? Okay, uh, yeah. I have a general question mm -hmm. uh, regarding uh, transfer learning and multitask learning. When I went back after last class, I wasn't able to understand what could be the difference between, let's say, training the entire model on one task and then training it a little more on some other task mm -hmm. versus training it on one task and, let's say, adding a few more layers for the second task by freezing these weights. Would both of them be classified as transfer learning and what would be the difference between that? So this is a really good question. Just to repeat it so everyone can hear, um, what is the difference between taking a full model and training it on uh, one task and then continuing training on another task. And also taking a full model, um, 
training it on one task and then adding a few other layers on top of it uh, for another task by freezing the by and freezing the original parameters. Uh, that's a really good thing that you asked that question because I'm going to talk about that later in this class. So <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll get to that then. Uh, any other high level things? Okay, great. Um, I might talk a little bit more about specifically this question later. It's not on the slides, but um, yeah. Okay, great. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is domain adaptation. I, I should actually just have called the section multi-domain learning. And I think a lot of people have probably heard of this before. If you haven't heard about it before, um, basically the idea of a domain in NLP is that especially, usually you're trying to solve essentially a single task. So the, in, the type of input and output that you're predicting is going to be the same. Uh, however, the data could be from very different distributions. So for example, you might want to do domain adaptation for language modeling or domain adaptation for parsing or uh, translation or something like this. And for example, your domains could be things like news text, medical text, spoken language, which all uh, get put into an encoder uh, and you know, be used for some particular tasks like uh, translation. One thing to note is that sometimes domains are labeled. So you might know the origin of the text that you are getting. Uh, so for example, let's say you wanted to create a translation service that translated different websites. And the way people entered the website was by copying and pasting the URL of the website. You could then infer the domain from the URL of the website and use that as additional information. So that would be when the domains are labeled. Uh, alternatively, uh, you might not have domains be labeled. So this would be an example like Google Translate, uh, where people copy and paste random text into the text box, and Google doesn't know where that came from. So uh, these are two different settings. So what exactly do I mean by domain? And actually, a lot of people uh, talk about domain adaptation or something like this without actually describing exactly what it means. Um, from my point of view, if you want to put this in the most general sense, what it means is that the joint distributions over the inputs and the outputs differ over domains one and two. So basically, um, you have uh, your input and your output, and the joint distribution of the two uh, differs uh, between them. So the either the inputs you see or the outputs that you get or the relationship between them uh, might be changing. And in practice in uh, NLP, what this means is that either the content changes, the content of what is being discussed, so like news and, um, uh, and sports, new, sorry, news and medical might be different content. Another thing is the style might change. So the style is the way in which something is discussed. And so you could also consider this a variety of domain adaptation. So even if the content is similar, maybe the register in which you are discussing it would be different, uh, either being formal or informal. And another thing is labeling standards. So like even if the content and the style are similar, um, for example, for annotation type tasks, you might have different ways of annotating the same data. So uh, for example, if you wanted to annotate sentiment, maybe some people would, or no, sentiment's not the best example. Let, let's say you wanted to annotate part of speech tags. And in uh, some cases, you might consider that um, noun and uh, proper noun are different part of speech tags. In other cases, you might consider that noun is uh, just one monolithic part of speech tag, but then you want to learn a model that does well at both uh, or is able to do well at both. So, um, yes. Within a single data set. So actually, in fact, that's kind of what I was alluding to here. You know, you might have a data set that actually 
derives from different domains. And, um, you know, sometimes they might not be labeled. In fact, you could also arbitrarily make this as fine grained or as coarse grained as you want. So you could say that um, we have a paper uh, that we called extreme, uh, extreme adaptation. I actually have two papers with extreme as the first word and it was completely unintentional, but um, the, uh, we called it extreme adaptation and it was basically personalizing uh, models to individual speakers. And if you think about it, that's an extreme version of domain adaptation where people might be talking about the same content, but the style in which they talk about it is slightly different. But um, yeah, so basically, uh, yes. <laughs> so long, long answer to the question. Um, is the mathematical definition ever used in practice to define domains? It seems like the joint distribution, uh, this is a question from Zoom. It seems like the joint distribution would be different for most non-trivial cases. Um, so are different me difference measures such as Kale divergence used, or is this just an illustration? Um, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good question. Um, maybe if I have time near the end, I can talk about this a little bit more from the point of view of something I'm going to introduce called distributionally robust optimization. Um, and uh, there's actually some pretty good theory about this. So I will, uh, I'll go into this in more detail later if I have time. Um, okay. So um, you can also characterize types of domain shift in different ways. So this I took from the recommended reading, which is actually a blog, but I think it's very, uh, very good at uh, illustrating these different types. So um, there, one type is called covariate shift, which is where the input changes, but not the labeling function. So basically we have the input distribution is different, but the inherent outputs are the same. So this would be an example of something like a labeling task where um, your labeling function is very well defined. Like let's say it's part of speech tagging according to universal part of speech tags or something like this, where you have a big annotation standard. Um, however, uh, the underlying data that you might be annotating would be very different. So some would be medical, some would be, uh, some would be news. Another thing is concept shift. And this is where the conditional distribution of labels changes. This is also called concept drift or other things. It's not, um, is uniformly named as covariate shift. But um, basically the idea is that the conditional distribution changes um, and possibly the distribution over the input might be the same. So if we think of something where the distribution over the input would be the same, and the conditional distribution would be different, it would be like annotation of the same data according to two annotation standards, two different standards. Um, another way you might think of it is uh, translation into multiple languages, for example. So you have the same input distribution, but you might want to translate it into multiple languages. This would be a very uh, like extreme form of this. So what, um, there's two types of things that you might want to consider with respect to domains. So uh, domain adaptation is basically training on many domains or a high resource domain, and then testing on a low resource domain. So uh, this similarly, you have, um, it's a type of transfer learning uh, where we have one domain of interest that we would want to do in the, uh, use in the end. Um, you can do either supervised or unsupervised adaptation. So you might or might not have training data for the domain that you're interested in um, with inputs and outputs. In the case of unsupervised adaptation, you will usually have uh, input data in that, uh, in that domain. So you might have input output pairs, which would be supervised, or you might only have input data, which would be unsupervised. Another thing that you might want to do is domain robustness. So this is for when you don't have a particular domain of interest and you want to just train one big model or when you're not sure what domain the model, uh, the input data would be coming from at test time. So here you train on many domains and you aim to do well on all of them. So you don't aim to do well, um, like, a model that is very good at translating news text, but very bad at translating medical text would be poor at domain robustness, essentially. Um, 
And this can be uh, framed in two ways. It actually links back to the previous question we had about having multiple domains in one data set. So one thing that you might want is robustness to minority domains. So if you have um, 100 million sentences of news and 100,000 sentences of medical, you would want both to be uh, you know, done well. And you can also have zero shot robustness to domains not in the training data. So this would be basically like um, uh, 100 million sentences of news text and no medical text, but nonetheless, you still want to be good at translating medical. Okay, um, any questions about this so far? It's just kind of a typology of concepts here. Yes. When you consider covariate shift and concept shift, which is harder? Um, that's a good question and it, it does have an answer. Does anybody uh, want to venture an answer? Um, so there's one thing that's constant, constant in covariate shift, um, uh, which is this, and concept shift doesn't have that constant, or doesn't necessarily have that constant, so uh, maybe concept shift is harder. Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's basically right. Um, I think another thing to think about is this is the actual thing you're trying to model, right? Um, and because of this, you can solve problems under covariate shift perfectly even if you don't know which domain the data came from. Uh, so you could create, if you could create a perfect model of P of Y given X and there was only covariate shift, um, it, it wouldn't matter what domain things came from. Um, of course, that's a big F, right? We know we can't create perfect models, which is why you're here in the class, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but yeah, concept shift is, it tends to be harder because you need to know which domain things are coming from to even do perfectly. Um, I see two hands, one, two. Yeah, so that's a really good, um, if you have a discriminative classifier, then covariate shift would not be a problem. Um, in theory, yes, but in practice, no. Um, I, I would like, I will also re-recommend the recommended reading uh, because it has a very good example of this there. Um, let me try to open it up very quickly. And the uh, basically, if you look, I have too many Zoom windows open, so they're getting in the way, but here. So we have the un understanding data set shift uh, blog here. And um, if we look at the why covariate shift is an issue though, let's say we have two, um, let's say we have two distributions. We have the training distribution and then we have a test distribution. And they all derive from this red function here. This is the target function that we'd like to learn. Um, but if we, uh, if we essentially were trying to fit this curve only on the training data, uh, we would fail to do a good job of fitting the curve anywhere that isn't well covered by the training data. So um, another like more intuitive version of this is if you train on lots of news data and then try to translate medical data, all of the stuff in the medical data is not gonna be in your vocabulary. So it doesn't matter that you have a, it doesn't matter that maybe translation would not be ambiguous in the medical domain. Uh, because still you don't know how to translate the vocabulary. So it's basically more due to a lack of coverage of the training data as opposed to the function being harder to model. Yeah, very, very good questions. Um, any others? Yeah. I'm having a little difficulty understanding why, like, what are kind of the real world examples of covariate shift? Because I mean, if you if you want to give the same label, like if the, you want to have the label with the same property given data, mm -hmm. uh, then does it really matter that they are from different domains? Yeah, well, so a real world example might be one uh, like the one that I 
just gave. Uh, so your training data is all news, and then you want to translate medical text. So it's yeah. For the same input, I know if you want to get the same label, but that's what uh, this is saying. Right? Probability of I given X is the same. Is right. So if I give you if I give you a sentence in the medical domain, there there might be some uh, for particularly ambiguous sentences, like if you just say um, cell or something like that. In the medical domain, that's almost always going to mean like a cell in your body, but in the news domain, it might also mean a prison cell or something. That- But then you're changing the distribution of Y given X. Right. And that would be correlation. Yeah, then you would be changing the distribution of Y given X, but the great majority of, um, the great majority of, outputs given the input are not going to be ambiguous so um so because of that like essentially you could almost look at the sentence and immediately know it's from the medical domain and then translate appropriately so uh, another uh, another example of covariate shift that is even more clear is the one that i gave before um for example part of speech tagging so part of speech tagging would almost never be influenced by what domain you're in because the syntax of the sentence is clear by just looking at this sentence, regardless of what, uh, what domain it is, it's from. So different tasks, I think there's no, there's probably no real NLP task that is purely covariate shift with no concept shift whatsoever. And, um, but I, I think there are various degrees to with uh, with respect to which this assumption holds, and it holds very strongly for some tasks like part of speech tagging, and it will hold less strongly uh, for some tasks like um, translation would be less strong than um, than part of speech tagging, and then you could go even farther, maybe like. Um, response, dialogue response generation might be more, uh, because it's more open-ended, it might be more uh, different, for example. Yeah. Uh, could it have trained a model on new data? That's what they But I want to test on mm -hmm. So which one of the Um. So it depends on how strongly your text classifier's answers depend um, might change given the same input across domains. So given the same input, uh, it like text classification is very broad, right? Um, so uh, maybe an easier, an easier to follow example, no, no, okay. So let, let's say topic classification or something like that. And now what are your topics? And can you with, could a human with mostly absolute certainty without knowing which domain the data comes from assign one of those topics with 100% accuracy? <laughs> if that's the case, there's no, that would be covariate shift only. Um, if it's not the case that you could have absolute certainty regardless of what domain it's in, then uh, it's very likely that there's some degree of concept shift going on. And that's true for any task, that'd be true for translation as well. So if you really need to know whether it's from the medical or the news domain to do a good job of translating, then that would be uh, more concept shift. Great, okay. Um, so let me move on to the next thing. And it might seem a little bit strange to put multilingual learning in the same bucket as domain adaptation, but from the point of view of machine learning models, it, there's actually some similarities. So um, this is a it, figure that I like to show. It just shows all the different languages that we have in the world. Um, uh, this is mo mostly focusing on endangered languages, um, but you can see there's uh, many, many languages up to 7,000. And uh, one of my goals in NLP is to make sure that, you know, all of these languages can be served. Um, however, uh, many of these languages have, you know, very few training data, so they're a particularly important target for being able to uh, apply these sort of multitask learning approaches. Um, part of the reason why we can do uh, multilingual learning at all is because 
Um, you know, for domains, it's relatively obvious that there's some similarity between, you know, English text in different domains, even if there are some differences, but it's true in languages as well. So um, many languages share similar words. So um, uh, there are things like cognates. Uh, cognates are words where because all of the languages evolved from a common ancestor, the words end up being the same. So uh, this is an example, English, French, Russian, and Bengali all use similar words for night um, and many other in, uh, Indo-European languages. There's also loan words. Um, so, uh, whoops, I, that should be English in the middle, sorry, coffee. Um, the, the French will get very mad at me for, the, uh, for making that mistake. Um, uh, but uh, we have loan, loan words which are borrowed from another language. So despite the fact that the languages don't have a joint origin, uh, they still use the same word. And I'm sure you can think of lots of these. Um, like if I'm listening to people speak in, in Chinese or Hindi and LTI, uh, like half of the words seem to be loan words where people are talking about transformers and uh, all the words. <laughs> Okay. Um, another thing is languages share a considerable amount of underlying structure. So even for languages with no uh, common ancestor, like English and Chinese, you can line up, uh, you know, the words in a very similar order. And um, there are some differences, like there's no uh, Chinese equivalent for this too, and there's no English equivalent for this uh, marker here. But, you know, still there's a lot of shared uh, structure between languages, even very different languages. So um, in order to take advantage of this, it's uh, now very common to train multilingual models. Um, and one way you can think of it is you can think of it as a big domain adaptation problem. Um, of course, it's not quite that simple, but uh, you take all of these things into your uh, language, you throw it into a big box that I've labeled NLP here. Um, and uh, so now this is a very good uh, tool for applying methods to low resource languages. And I'll, I'll talk about um, some specific examples of this later. Um, and uh, for multilingual learning, um, we can think of it as an extreme uh, variety where different language is a different domain and adaptation is improving the accuracy on lower resource languages that we care about by transferring knowledge from higher resource languages. And uh, robustness is using one model for all languages instead of one for each. And um, uh, you might want to use these in different situations. Like let's say there's a language that you really care about um, doing well on uh, in like that language in particular, you might want to do adaptation um, or if you're, for example, a big tech company that has to serve hundreds of languages, uh, you might want to try to train a single model that does well on, uh, on many different languages so you can serve it well on a server or something like that. Um, so at the same time, uh, there's much more complexity. And the reason why is because for the reason that I talked about before, um, it, Language, different languages are much more different than, uh, than different domains in the same language, usually anyway. And because of that, it requires modeling similarities and differences in lexicon, morphology, syntax, semantics, and even culture. And because of this, um, you need to try a lot harder. It's a much more extreme version of covariate shift. You might not be able to use covariate or, or label shift. Uh, sorry, uh, or concept shift. And you might not be able to just use out of the box learning algorithms to deal with it and you need to do something more tailored. Okay. Um, so now moving on to uh, the actual technical approaches to doing these kind of things. Uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about is parameter sharing methods. And this goes back to the question that I had uh, at the very beginning of like, whether we can freeze things and update only part of the model, et cetera. And uh, so there's a number of ways, I'm trying to break this down into a typology like a lot of the stuff I've done this time. So there's a number of ways to share parameters. Uh, one way you can do this is sharing all parameters. Uh, so you train a single model for all domains or languages. 
Another thing is you can do you can do is share some model components, but not others. So uh, one example of this would be sharing an encoder and having a separate decoder. Um, and another option is to have a very small number of uh, unshared parameters, uh, such as a single embedding specifying the domain or some other variety of, uh, of things. So um, I'll go through each of these in turn. So examples of full parameter sharing. Um, the easiest way you can do full parameter sharing is just pretend like there's no difference in domain whatsoever. So you just ignore all of the domain differences and train a single model. Um, this is a first step that a lot of people will use when they want to train on uh, you know, multiple domains. It's just like ignore the fact that your new, new text comes from the medical domain. Um, it's not a very good strategy for perhaps obvious reasons, uh, because domain shifts can cause really big changes in accuracy, but um, uh, it is one step. Um, interestingly, this is, so this is something rather obvious. This is something people have been doing for a long time. Uh, the second thing is something that's a little bit less obvious, and actually I wouldn't have necessarily thought would work well a priori until I saw papers saying that it did. Um, and so some examples include doing multilingual machine translation into English. Um, I specifically chose this, not because I want to promote my paper, um, which is a very good paper, so you should read it, but uh, <laughs> um, not because I want to promote my paper, but actually because it's relatively unusual to translate uh, into a single language. Um, a lot of work is worked on translating into multiple languages, but um, uh, the reason why this is important is because um, to train a single model with no unshared parameters, you really need to have a single target distribution. And that goes back to the idea of concept shift, right? Because concept shift is saying your conditional distribution over the output is constant given the input. And you can only uh, do that well if, uh, if your output is like, you only have one variety of output that you're generating like English. Another example is uh, multilingual pre-trained language models that are used for text classification. So the most famous example of this is multilingual BERT. And what they did in multilingual BERT is they trained the standard BERT model, uh, but they just trained it on all of Wikipedia instead of only English Wikipedia. Um, so it was pretty impressive that this worked as well as it did uh, when it first came out. Now there's a lot of follow-up work. But um, the, the basic idea is uh, you just train an LM, it's a single LM uh, that's trained on many languages, then maybe you, uh, you fine tune it to do some task on English or on many different, uh, on data from many different languages, and then you just apply it universally, and then you rely on the fact that the shared representations are good enough to uh, do whatever um, uh, task you want to do. Um, so, like as I alluded to before, um, this only works if you're uh, if you only have a single conditional distribution. Um, this method can never work if you have different conditional distributions depending on the domain. It can never work perfectly if you have different conditional di distributions depending on the domain you're working. So. Uh, Another thing is simple parameter decoupling uh, through the use of domain tags. And what do I mean by this? Um, this is extremely simple. And because it's extremely simple, it's also very popular. Um, oh, uh, sorry, let me see the question. Um, what, what are the differences between the fourth and the first bullet points on the previous slide? Um, Between, between the cannot achieve the ideal accuracy and the ignore domain differences. I mean, th these ignoring domain differences in multilingual training are, are basically the same, essentially. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so these, are, these, are all, um, these are all instances of ignoring domain differences and just training a single model. So yeah, they're, they're not different. They're just different examples. Um, 
so I, I had a, another question, which was uh, for full parameter sharing, how do we decide the training order of the different languages? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I'm going to talk about how we choose the sampling function of the different languages later. So maybe uh, we can revisit that question uh, in a bit. Um, so uh, another thing we could do is um, simple parameter decoupling um, using a domain tag. And the, um, the way this works is uh, we append a tag to the input. And this can be a single token like news or medical. And what this does is this allows, so it, as I mentioned, it does not, it, it is not possible to model the distribution perfectly under, if we have covariate shift, uh, sorry, uh, concept shift. However, what this domain tag is doing essentially is it's, um, it's adding another piece of information here uh, into the conditional in the conditional probability. And because now we are conditioning on the domain, the model, it, a sufficiently kind of expressive model could then learn, well, now I'm looking at domain D, I should be changing my conditional distribution of the output appropriately. So this basically will remedy uh, this will remedy any problems with uh, respect to this. Um, so another uh, example of this is translating into several languages by adding a tag about the target language. So basically, um, we add to the input uh, French and uh, Japanese. And by doing this, uh, we can basically control whether it is uh, translating into French or Japanese. So. Um, Translation into different languages is kind of an extreme version of concept shift, uh, as I mentioned before. So uh, because like, because basically if you are uh, translating in domain one of Japanese versus domain two of French, um, here the distribution would be over French sentences, here the distribution would be over Japanese sentences. So obviously that's a, a major change. Um, and so this in introduces a small number of parameters uh, for each domain. Um, specifically, it introduces a single embedding. Uh, so the number of parameters is equal to the size of the input embeddings that you're using in your model. So like, as I said, this is very simple, uh, relatively parameter efficient, and so it's used quite widely. Yeah. For example, uh, since normal model can Yeah, so this is a very, um, I, I actually had two related questions, one from the room, one from Zoom. Um, they're related, but not exactly the same. Um, so in the first question, it was, couldn't the model predict on its own whether it's a news text or a medical text? Um, and then you wouldn't need the domain tag in the first place, right? Um, good question. The second question was, uh, would it make sense to predict the domain tag instead of adding it as an input signal? So in the case where the model is able to predict um, whether it's a news text or not, uh, yes, basically you do not need to add an extra tag here. However, um, models are not perfect and sometimes adding a domain tag like this is a more direct way to, um, to influence the model appropriately. So just to give a very obvious example, um, uh, there's uh, work by Divyanch Kaushik and uh, others, uh, Zach Lipton uh, and Hovi here at CMU, where basically they look at uh, the influence of domain on text classification for sentiment. And um, one interesting thing is that the um, in the reviews that they used, um, romance movies tended to get higher ratings and horror movies tended to get lower ratings. So what, the mod what a simple model would learn is it would learn that things that are indicative of romance are 
positive sentiment words and things that are indicative of poor are negative sentiment words. And so because of this, um, there's kind of this indirect path, um, like domain. Um, where basically the model is inferring the domain from the text and then using it to influence the label prediction. Um, but if you provide this information more directly, the model can more efficiently learn that, hey, a priori, I expect that romance movies will have a higher score, horror movies will have a lower score. And so then the model can use the rest of its capacity to not infer the domain but rather infer the actual inherent like rules underlying sentiment, I guess. So basically what you're doing is you're making the inference path more direct. And because of that, it makes it more easier to, you can take advantage of the things that you know already are going to be important given the domain and then you can use your model capacity elsewhere, essentially. Um, then uh, with regards to whether it would make sense to predict the domain tag, um, predicting the domain tag is, is certainly something you could do. Um, one issue with this is if in a legitimate case of uh, concept shift where um, the conditional probability of the output given the input changes, uh, you can't do that. So like, for example, in the second example here, you could not predict the domain tag because you don't know which language you should be translating into. Okay, great. Very good questions. Um, so one, uh, one problem though with uh, these minimal uh, parameter decoupling methods is that they're often insufficient. So for example, um, just to take the example from multilingual learning where this is most stark, um, in a fixed size model, um, the per language capacity decreases as we increase the number of languages. And um, in, for example, increasing the number of languages decreases the quality of, uh, causes a decrease in the quality of accuracy in all languages. So this is an example from a, a paper by Kano et al, uh, 2019, where they basically modeled, um, created a model with seven languages, 15 languages, 30, 60, 100. And what you can see is, um, the low resource languages and the high resource languages are split into orange and blue. And um, as you added a few more languages, the low resource languages improved a little bit because there were maybe more similar languages to learn from. Um, but eventually, as you increase the number of languages to 100, uh, given a reasonably sized model, the accuracy of all of the languages basically goes down. And the reason why is because you're sharing the parameters between all of these, you know, very, very different domains, right? And it's not sufficient to essentially have a single model that allows you to, um, with shared parameters that allows you to model all of these domains without, you know, decoupling them in any way. So another extreme, um, which is not used very commonly nowadays, but um, was uh, proposed in the past, is you can have one encoder or decoder per uh, domain or particularly per language in this case. And um, so what this looks like is basically if you have a machine translation model, if you're encoding English, French, Spanish, German, and uh, in Korean in a single model, you would have one encoder for each, and then you would have one decoder for each, but then you might share the attention mechanism between them or uh, train multilingually. And um, this, this is not a horrible idea. It's, uh, you know, languages are very different, so it might make sense to decouple the parameters, but there are two disadvantages. One is that you can't share uh, information when the languages or domains are very legitimately similar. Um, and another is an explosion in the number of parameters. Or when I say explosion, it linearly increases um, with the number of domains or languages that you want to handle. And I'm sure all of you are already uh, very concerned about your batch size and uh, fitting all of your BERT into memory, your GPU memory or stuff like that. And so you probably don't even want to think about what it would look like if you had 
a hundred encoders uh, to fit everything. So um, that's another issue. So um, there's a couple other alternatives. Um, one alternative is uh, minimum. Um, there's a couple other alternatives that kind of take a, a halfway approach between the two. Um, one is that's used quite widely is adapters. And adapters are essentially things that add a small layer per task to an already trained model. And um, this is an example from the transformer architecture. Basically what they do is they take a feed forward layer and they add this adapter um, after the feed forward layer. And then um, they also add it, uh, let's see. Actually, um, yeah, so this is, this is a second feed forward layer. So they have the adapter here. And basically what an adapter looks like is um, you have a feed forward um, down projection, a nonlinearity and a feed forward up projection. So basically what they're doing is they are taking a big input and downscaling it, uh, running it through a nonlinearity um, and then upscaling it again. And the reason why uh, they chose this specific model architecture is um, the size of the intermediate layer can limit the, like how many parameters you have in your model. Um, so if you make this intermediate layer very small, then you're adding only a minimal number of uh, parameters to your model. And notably, um, there's a residual connection here. So there's a residual connection uh, connecting from the input to the output. And because of this, if you took the extreme and made this size zero, then you would essentially be making no changes to your model. Um, but if you make it a little bit bigger than that, you're allowing the model to do, um, to do adaptation to like each individual domain. And um, basically you will learn a different adapter for each domain that you are interested in handling or each language you're interested in handling. And there's even some examples of adapter um, models that uh, consider both tasks and uh, languages or you know, uh, domains and languages and, and things like that. Yeah. Um, so you have those two adapters in the entire adapter. Yeah. Can you kind of detail the difference between the two parameters and how those two parameters are doing the same? You insert it in between pre trained layers, yes. Um, and the, these are kind of like standard places to insert the adapters, but um, you could you know, put it anywhere in the model if you wanted to. Um, how does the pre-trained model adjust to handling these? Um, so as I said, the kind of default for the adapter would be to not change anything. So you're only making minimal, uh, you know, you're only making minimal changes, only the changes that are effective at in decreasing the loss here. Um, there's a lot of other methods that can be used. Like um, I, uh, one method I didn't talk about was the like freezing most of the parameters of the model and then fine tuning um, like the last layer of the model. Um, that's definitely something that you could do. Um, uh, another thing that I didn't add here is um, there are kind of like variations on the domain tag thing here. Uh, one popular one recently is called prefix tuning. And basically what it does is it adds not a single tag, but it adds like 200 words at the beginning of the sentence. And because you're adding 200 words at the beginning of the sentence, um, you are, uh, you're increasing the capacity of them to influence your downstream decisions. And you can add them for every, every input layer and things like this. So there's other, um, there's other recent uh, like methods for this sort of parameter efficient tuning and adapters are just one example. Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically the point there is to not have a parameter flow, right? Yes. So then wouldn't like the only way this might probably work is then you the only across languages only the adapt the value that the adapter change that everything else remains frozen to the same parameter. So oh. then we'll have to yeah yeah. 
Otherwise, you'll have to save different part of the strategy language you'll end up with. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. I forgot to mention that explicitly. But um, the, the point of adapters is that everything else in the model stays frozen. So I, I realize now that I didn't actually mention that directly. But yeah, everything but the adapters in the model stays frozen. So you're only tuning the parameters of the adapters. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's um, there's actually quite a few examples of this. I'm not going to go into them in a whole lot of detail because there's a lot of stuff to talk about in the class, but happy to discuss more with people if you want to have more details. Cool. So another, um, another important thing to think about if in particular in adaptation scenarios. So in not in the scenario where you want to be robust to many different domains, but where you have one that you specifically want to uh, do well on is regularization. And regularization um, basically prevents your model from getting too far away from the original model. Uh, because if you have a very small amount of data in the domain you're interested in and you're tuning your model on that, uh, you can very quickly overfit and do a, a bad job at, uh, at learning on that uh, model. So um, basically we need some sort of regularization to prevent us from moving away too far. The most common type of regularization, which is definitely a very, a very legitimate way of doing this is early stopping. So basically what you do is you stop uh, training after a certain amount of time uh, before the model starts to overfit. Um, you, you can actually show, um, so uh, sorry, I'll, I'll go on to the next one. First. So um, you can also have explicit regularization. So this is where you save the original model parameters and you have um, a uh, like L2 uh, regularization penalty on the difference from the initial parameters. So uh, this would look a little bit like this. So you have the pre-trained uh, parameters and then you have the difference between the parameters. And um, what you do is you train the model uh, based on the uh, parameters, but then you have a norm over the difference between the parameters and you try to keep the combination of these two objectives small. Um, there's actually some work that demonstrates that early stopping with stochastic gradient descent is kind of like an implicit uh, version of L2 regularization. There are some differences or implicit version of regularization, um, but uh, there are some differences as well. So doing it explicitly uh, is not a bad idea. Um, another thing is uh, dropout. Um, interestingly from this paper, uh, they demonstrate that dropout with early stopping is actually as good or better, uh, like a high level of dropout plus early stopping is actually as good or better um, as explicit regularization. So um, this that's kind of good news because this is also more complicated. You have to keep around two copies of the parameters and, and things like that. So that's a good thing to be aware of as well. Okay, um, any questions about this? Yes, sure. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a good question. So if you have adapters that are trained on different domains, what is the original model trained on? Um, there's a couple uh, answers to this. The most common answer to this is that you have a pre-trained language model like BERT, and then you use this together with BERT or MBERT or something like that to adapt the model to new domains. Um, another uh, answer could be that you train a large supervised model on many different domains. And then when you want to adapt it to a new domain, you use an adapter to uh, kind of tune in a parameter efficient fashion. So I think both of those would be options. Does this also work for multilingual? Yeah, there is a lot of work on applying adapters. Um, so usually it is uh, you use something like MBERT and then you do further adaptation by adding the adapters when you do the fine tuning stage there. Um, I had a question on Zoom. Could you also minimize the difference between the adapt and diff params instead of keeping the diff params smaller? You could uh, minimize the difference between the adapt and pre 
uh, parameters. Uh, maybe that's what you uh, what you meant. And yeah, ba basically you can do this. Adding the diff thing is a little bit uh, like I don't know. You you already have these parameters like saved in memory, so it's a little bit easy, like more convenient, I guess. Um, cool. So uh, another thing is um, soft parameter tying for multi-link multitask learning. This is um, also very similar to the adaptation that I talked about before. Um, so uh, th this is when you're training uh, in multiple languages and you can actually um, have explicit regularization over the difference between parameters, but you can do it on different levels uh, in different places. So this is uh, up here, you might have a certain regularization down here, you might have a certain regularization. Um, and in this particular case, they didn't even bother regularizing the difference between words across languages because the words across languages were already so different that it's not worth uh, doing in the first place. So basically what I wanted to demonstrate here is that you can go uh, wild with your uh, imagination on how you regularize your model. This is something where explicit regularization is a good idea because you can't easily do something like this with early stuff. Okay, um, another thing that people uh, often do is selective parameter uh, adaptation. So this is uh, adapting a subset of the parameters. Uh, this is one early example from cross-lingual transfer in neural machine translation where they basically uh, fixed some parameters, but uh, trained other parameters. So they demonstrated basically that uh, with no retraining, they did a very bad job of uh, translation. Um, so they trained a neural MT model on one, uh, one language and then adapted it to another language. With no retraining whatsoever, they did quite poorly. Uh, retraining the uh, source embeddings, uh, so just re retraining the embeddings of words on the source side uh, for, I think, um, to make this more concrete, this was like French English to Uzbek English translation, so the, the target decoder was English. Then they, uh, they unlocked the source RNN, unlocked the target RNN, and then unlocked the target attention and basically got the best results, but actually adapting the target side language model didn't help because they had so little data. So it basically broke the English language model. So um, you can see this actually is a hard version of regularization where you regularize um, the uh, like target side with an infinite uh, coefficient. Basically, you, you make sure that it doesn't change at all, but you let all of the other ones uh, work as well. Um, let all of the other ones change as well as you would like. Um, and there's also some work that uh, I have done previously that shares sub networks of the transformer models. And so you can share like the way um, the key matrices, the uh, query matrices, the value matrices, et cetera. Okay. Um, so up until now, this was all about sharing the actual parameters of the model. This is one. This, I'm actually going to be talking about this in more detail near the end of the class, but I think it's important enough to start discussing it now. Um, but you can also do regularization in feature space. And the idea behind doing regularization in feature space is basically um, if you want to train a, um, let's see, if you want to train a text classifier that does well on sentiment analysis for many different domains of movies, for example, um, you might want to kind of remove the effect of the domain itself. So you encourage the model to focus on more inherent things and not kind of fit a spurious correlation that romance related words uh, tend to be uh, associated with like high sentiment scores essentially. So the way uh, this works is basically you have your feature extractor, uh, which is the thing in the green here. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. And then you have your classifier in the blue. So these are this is the normal thing you train. But in addition to this, you have a domain classifier where you try to train the domain classifier to predict the domain. 
but then you try to train the feature extractor to not allow the domain classifier to predict the domain. So this is using a method called adversarial training. As I said, we're going to talk about this uh, more in the, uh, later in the class. But the effect that this has is this causes the feature extractor to try to extract features that are indistinguishable whether like which domain they came from. And because of this, um, traditionally, you might have a feature extractor that extracts features um, that are all the way over here in the romance domain and all the way over here in the horror domain, and there's not much overlap. So you can view this as covariate shift, right? There's not very much overlap between them. So any classifier that you train on top of these features is likely to not do a very good job because it, it won't generalize well. But if you train with this uh, domain adversarial setting, basically what it will do is it will make sure that these features uh, like get pushed into the same space. Uh, so there's not a difference in domains. And uh, this might allow the model to generalize better. And in fact, it does. Great. OK. Um, any other uh, any questions about this? So um, one thing I should mention is um, I'm introducing a lot of uh, things here. And one question that might be in people's minds is like, which one should I actually use in my situation? Um, I would suggest that you start out with the simple things. So start out with uh, maybe a simple domain tag like this. And then as you start realizing that you're, uh, you're having issues with your models, you can start uh, thinking about more, uh, more complicated things like adding adapters. Um, oh, you should always be early stopping, but you're doing that anyway, probably like all uh, standard training regimes, uh, regimens include early stopping. Um, and uh, then only when you're not seeing good results from that, can you start more complicated things like soft parameter tying um, selective parameter adaptation or uh, feature space reutilization. So that's just my my recommendation. Okay. So another thing I'd like to talk about is task weighting. So like, let's say we have lots of tasks that we would uh, like to be training on, be it lots of actual tasks or domains or languages. Um, so uh, there's a couple questions that we'd like to answer here. Um, like how much to learn on each task and when to learn on each task. Um, so how much to learn on each task can be formulated in two ways. One way is through task weighting. And basically what you do is you add an additional weight to the loss function of each task and um, upweight it or downweight it depending on how important you think it is. Um, another thing is task sampling. So this is uh, similar to weighting but um, you modify the proportion of the time that you sample a mini batch from that task or an example from that task. Um, another thing is when to learn on each task, uh, where you can choose the ordering of tasks. This is uh, curriculum learning. So um, there are some simple task weighting strategies and more involved ones. Um, so a first simple task weighting strategy is uniform. So this is the one that I mentioned before, basically, you sample a single batch from each task where you give them an equal weight in your loss function. Um, another one uh, would be proportional. So like, let's say you have lots and lots of language modeling data and only a very small amount of part of speech tagging data or sentiment analysis data. If you sample an equivalent number of batches from both in the same training time, you will very quickly overfit to your classifier, um, but you won't over you won't even have started fitting your language model appropriately because you have lots and lots of data for that. So uh, because of this, another option is to basically sample according to the data size. So if you have 100 times more language modeling data, you would sample 100 times more batches from the language modeling task. Finally, um, there are temperature-based strategies where you basically sample tasks according to the data size. Uh, exponentiated by one divided by uh, tau. So this tau is your temperature. 
And um, if tau is equal to one, then that is equal to the proportional sampling strategy. So basically it's directly proportional to the data size. If tau is set to uh, infinity, then this becomes uniform. You basically smooth out the distribution. And if tau is set somewhere in the middle, like t equals five, then um, you will downweight the high frequency tasks, upweight the low frequency tasks, but you'll still have some diff like something in the middle. Um, there's also data-driven approaches to task weighting. Oh, sorry, please go ahead. Uh, why, why would we want to do this in the first place? Okay, yeah, so uniform and proportional both have their problems. So the problem with uniform is that if one task has a very small data size, um, you could overfit to that task very quickly. So like, let's say you have 500 examples uh, and then 5 million examples for another task. So um, if you sample uniformly, you'll sample, you'll like way over fit on the 500 examples. However, if you do proportional, you'll spend like the entirety of your time on the high data task. Basically, um, you'd spend a thousand times more time on the 5 million example. Uh, task or 10,000 times more. So because of that, you would never learn the low frequency task. So basically temperature-based balances between those two extremes. Okay. Um, so data-driven task weighting, um, there's uh, different ways to do this. Um, one method is loss scaling. And loss scaling is actually not um, entirely based on uh, the on whether the data is frequent or not, it's more based on the scale of the losses. So it's more appropriate for cases where you have two very different tasks. Um, one example of this would be like language modeling and text classification, because in language modeling, you're making one prediction for each word over a very large set of words. And for text classification, you're making one prediction for each sentence or document over um, a very small number of classes often. So the, the loss for language modeling might be much larger than the loss for um, than the loss for uh, text classification. So what loss scaling does essentially is it um, it adds a penal or it it normalizes the loss by a term that's basically intended to model the variance of the loss or the scale of the loss. But then you also have a penalty to try to reduce the size of this coefficient here. And so the idea is this is a learnable coefficient where um, you can make it larger to uh, reduce the variance of, or to reduce the scale of the loss, but you also pay a penalty for doing that uh, here. So um, this is a way to balance between uh, different tasks with different scales of their loss. Um, another thing that you can do is directly uh, optimize the weights of each task um, to improve the accuracy on a development set. And this is particularly useful when, for example, you have a transfer learning scenario where you know that you want to do well on, for example, text classification, but you also want to add auxiliary objectives like language modeling that allow you to, um, to learn like reusable representations. And um, the idea is you have a dev set from the task that you're actually interested in. And um, you calculate the gradients uh, with respect to this dev set. And you measure the similarity of the gradients um, of different auxiliary training tasks and upweight tasks with similar gradients um, downweight tasks with divergent gradients. And this is, um, this is a method uh, pretty widely used in uh, things like meta-learning, which uh, I might talk about later if we have some time. Uh, but the basic idea being that uh, this gives you an idea about which tasks are useful for, um, for doing well at the task that you actually care about. So this is another a very advanced option. You probably don't want to use this as your first pass, but you could consider it. Is that even is it calculated on examples specifically to that task? 
Okay, how do you come like if you could give an idea of how the three values are? Okay, so basically what you do is you calculate the loss function and then calculate the gradient with respect to the parameters for each of the tasks. So you might calculate it over the dev set for the task you care about and then calculate it with respect to task one and task two. Uh, but I mean, then the vectors would be like totally, I mean, one might have 100 parameters, other might have 200 parameters. Um, it's always the same parameters. So uh, like, you might have some unshared parameters and you can just ignore them uh, because basically the dot product between unrelated parameters, uh, spe eh, task specific parameters would be zero because um, if you only use them for one task, they don't get any gradient. Um, so this would be more uh, like the things over the body of a BERT model or something like this that's shared between all of the tasks. So another, um, another interesting thing to think about is uh, choosing transfer tasks. So I talked about this a little bit last time uh, with respect to language modeling and why language modeling is a good transfer task. Some of the reasons being that language modeling has lots of data. And also in order to solve language modeling, you need to solve lots of other uh, issues uh, like syntax and semantics and other things like this. Um, however, uh, you know, there are other tasks. We also talked about how modeling natural language inference is a good task uh, because it's a, or was empirically found to be a good task for sentence embeddings. So um, which task could we be choosing from? Um, so one answer is you just pick intuitively. Um, you, you think, oh, I know a lot about NLP. I know that this is a, semantic heavy tasks. So I should be, uh, you know, picking another task that considers semantics. Um, another example is if you're doing multilingual learning and you know about different languages, you can say, well, this language is more similar uh, than this language. So maybe I should be using this. Um, but another option is to do empirical selection. So you basically run many uh, transfer experiments and try to uh, pick which task gives you the best accuracy in the end. Um, so uh, this is an example of some work that we did uh, where we trained a model to predict which language was the best to transfer from. And uh, the way we did this was we ran a whole bunch of experiments. Um, and I can actually show you how many experiments we ran. So we basically have a spreadsheet where we transferred from many different languages. So in all of these examples, we have the target language and we transferred from all of these languages. So I ran about a thousand machine translation experiments to create the spreadsheet. Um, it took about three months. And um, from this, what we can do is we can deduce the best uh, language to transfer from uh, for this target language. And for the case of Azerbaijani, it's Turkish, uh, which is not surprising because Turkish is very similar, but then somewhat surprisingly, it's Korean and Farsi, which are like even in different scripts, but they have somewhat similar syntactic properties. So um, then based on this, we came up with a lot of uh, features that um, basically allowed you to, uh, to express whether something might be useful, like how similar are they on the language family tree? How much data is there available in the language you're transferring from? How much word overlap is there between them to model like cognates and uh, loan words and stuff like that. So based on this, you can then train a system where you get a new language and it predicts which task would be useful for you. Um, and there's also a really nice uh, paper looking at multitask learning on individual link on like English basically. Um, so if you're also interested in that as well, you can look up this reference. Here they take an approach of rather trying to learn embeddings of tasks using a number of different input features. So it's maybe a little bit less uh, straightforward than the one above, but I think they're both uh, good references if you're interested. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, would there be a lot of parameters for each model? I, that's a very good question because you have to come up with one model for each transfer language. There's two ways you could do that. Um, well, so no, actually, sorry, to be clear, we only train a single model. Um, there's a different model for each transfer task, but for each language that we, oh, 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 I, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood the question. Now I understand the question. So um, because I trained so many models here, um, doesn't each one of these models have lots of parameters? So this is a very large number of parameters. Is that the, the question? Yeah, so so this is a very large number of parameters. It's a thousand gene translation models. So yeah, running this experiment is extremely expensive, but the idea is if we run this experiment once, then if we get a new language or like a new task, as long as we can turn it into features in some way, um, then we can make a prediction over new, uh, over new tasks. Uh, so we train a model that allows us to take in the features and choose uh, the best transfer task, yeah. It was not, and that's actually an important point. Um, the training data size for the source languages, because the training data size is not the same for different languages. So very often we will have to make a trade-off between do we want to use this language with less data but more similar to the target language or more data but less similar to the target language. So um, considering both of those, we add those to the features of the predictor that makes the decision there. And that's also the case uh, for multitask learning. Do we want to use LM objective or uh, natural language inference objective? And if that's the case, then we need to make a trade-off between them. We need to decide. Yeah. Does, does the writing take this into account that you might be having like, uh, so a low resource language if it's doing similar, like, I mean, a low resource language is doing better while translating into a specific language. And do you take that into account that if I had more data, I could have done this better. So you might rank it higher than. Yeah. Data. So uh, a question: the question is, do you take into account that if I had even more data, it might do even better? We actually have a follow-up work to this where we try to extrapolate: um, if I had more data, how much better would I do? Which is particularly interesting to practitioners, also because you know, hey, maybe we don't have a lot of data in this language, but we could hire some people to make some, and if we do, how much gain could we expect? So yeah. Are, are there cases where transferring doesn't help or, or even hurts? Uh, yes, there are. Um, there's a nice paper characterizing and mitigating negative transfer um, uh, by Ziri Wang uh, here at CMU, and you could, uh, you could take a look at that. Um, so question. Uh, regarding the follow up work, uh, when you extrapolated the, uh, the one that we just mentioned, so does, does that mean when you further go down into different, different chunks and uh, train even more uh, on different sizes of the current existing size of the training data? Um, did we break down into chunks and train on different sizes of the training data? Yes, we did that for test time, but we didn't do that at training time. So basically, we we hoped that the model would be able to extrapolate by seeing different training settings. Um, cool, I'm over time. I will only do the next slide and then I'll finish up because I think this is kind of important. Um, so the idea of distributionally robust optimization is that we'd like to find a model that does well over multiple domains. And uh, distributionally robust optimization is an alternative training objective that optimizes the worst case loss that we get on multiple domains. And so what this means is, let's say we have 10 domains that we want to be doing well at, it will optimize, essentially, it, it's actually a little bit more involved in this than this, but to give the very simplest example, um, if you have 10 domains, it will optimize to raise up the worst loss that we have right now. So if we have a minority domain uh, that is doing poorly, it will prioritize optimizing on that domain. So um, the, uh, there's NLP applications across uh, language modeling and MT across languages. 
Um, I had a question at the very beginning that I promised to answer, so I'll do it now, which is there's actually a lot of different ways to define the space of loss functions that you optimize over. And so you don't necessarily need to divide up into 10 discrete domains. You can also divide up into different subsets of the training data that you have that are defined in different ways. So basically, um, you, divide, you define a space of, you define a space of probability distributions over the input and output labels um, and try to maximize, try to minimize the worst case loss over the space of all of these domains. So um, how you define this is a very interesting question, but um, I'm over time. So if you want to learn more, you can come up and talk uh, afterwards. So uh, thank you everyone, we'll finish up here.